right, welcome to the 100 Authors in 100 Days, and I'm your host, Adriana. Today, it's all about conversations for transformation, where we find the story behind the story, a place where we get the opportunity to explore why the author became the author, and what we can learn from it as a collective. We explore writers, authors, luminaries, all writing about life, the world, and our future in it. So with us today is Luz Maria Mack, the author of seven books. Um, she, she says, um, like many, uh, she says, like many of her children, her children are curious to learn more about their parents and their family's experiences when they were kids. Her children wanted to know if her husband and her were anything like them when they were little and if they had similar experiences. Although she was born in a different country, although she was born in a different country. Her, birth, her books were born out of curiosity to represent in a meaningful way children and their unique experiences with a positive message. Luz is happily married with um, her amazing husband and is a proud mother of three beautiful children. She asserts that being a wife and a mother to three little ones motivates her to write and bring forth all the beautiful things that her creative soul can conjure up in an easy to read, in easy to read books. And uh, Luz Maria Mack was born in Villa Mella in Dominican Republic, uh, immigrated to the United States as a young child with her family. She comes from a loving big family that is a recipe for laughter and lots of beautiful memories. I love that. <laughs> I love I love what you wrote because it's so it's so honest in in your in your page and stuff. So how old are your little your little girls or is it is it girls? So I have two girls and one boy. The oldest is turning 14 next week, which is very exciting. And the middle daughter is nine. And my son, he's just turned six. So he is still a baby to me, even though he says he's a man. <laughs> so your oldest one, she's going to high school now? Yes. And actually, we just got the email that we have to help, like, kind of gear up to helping her find her focus in high school. Because I, I feel like that's kind of like what they're doing now in high school. Like, they channel their you know, all their academic courses based on their interests. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I have my, I have a 13 year old that's going to high school next year and I haven't um, even, I have a girl, I have not even registered him for high school or anything because I'm still figuring out the details. And yesterday we went and drove by the high school that we would want him to go, uh, you know, be part of or join or because there, there's a bunch of different types of schools here in Las Vegas and it was closed and I couldn't get through. So I don't even know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so for, for us, it was, it was different because uh, we chose to uh, enroll our kids at a young age to private schools. Oh. Here they call them independent schools. So a lot of these schools tend to be K through 12. Like, so it's like an entire experience. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky enough to get her into a school called Calhoun in the third grade. But to be honest, it's not an easy process. It's not an easy experience too, because uh, she's the only Latina, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in some of the, the grades. I mean, you do meet a lot of other Latinos, but for the majority of the kids tend to be like white or you know upper east side families or upper west side families and it's just such a different experience from like me growing up in Dominican Republic where everyone was Dominican <laughs> or right or even here in Washington Heights that everyone looks like me is like me like another example one of the biggest deals that the school is really proud of is that they hire more they were made a conscious effort to hire more kids I mean more uh, teachers that were either African American or Latino, which is great, but like when you think about it, there's only like a very small percentage of them. Mm -hmm. So kids still need to see that in every aspect of their life so they know how to relate. Yes, absolutely. And you'd be surprised. It does It does matter if um, the teacher or is white or is Latina. I, it mattered to me. And this was, you know, when I remember when I was in high school, uh, over 25 years ago, we only had one Latina teacher in all of the school. So I went to an all white school and um, it was really difficult because it yeah. was, uh, you know, uh, my confidence was like in the toilet and the only little words of hope and wisdom was from that one teacher that said, you know what? You're going to make it, you're going to be fine, and you're not what people say that you are. So it, it, does, it does make a difference. And um, I did. So, did you grow up most of your life in the Dominican Republic? I did. I came here um, 
when I was, I want to say seven or eight, it was, I say seven or eight because, you know, we kept going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I remember that very, uh, like early uh, childhood memory of just like, oh my gosh, yes, I'm leaving New York City back home. Like home was always Dominican Republic at one point in time. And that's how even my mother uh, put a reference to it. I think the shift changed when we started noticing how like hard it was to afford those plane tickets. You know, mm -hmm. we we didn't grow up rich, but I know a big bulk of our family was in Dominican Republic. Eventually with time, people started immigrating here and there's a lot of family here. Mm -hmm. And the little bit of family that is there, you know, they have the possibility of traveling back and forth mm -hmm. as many times. I feel kind of sad because um, my kids haven't gotten to go there or experience the things I experienced when I was in DR. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th I think that um, we have a lot of things in common because it's it's almost like just like you. I've also tried to even though I was born in California, my mom would take us to Mexico and we would go there a lot, and it was like two worlds. And uh, yeah. or I went to the American school system, but I really struggled. I mean, I didn't learn English until later on. I, I was always in ESL classes. Even now, I'm, it's so hilarious. I'm, I'm a writer, and I have a hard time pronouncing words and writing. And and that and and I've learned to say to myself, "Okay, I'm okay." <laughs> you know what I? You know what I would do? And 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 I'm and I'm so glad you brought up that point. Even as a like. Let's take a step back as me as a writer, but like as a student, I remember going to ESL and the people that were teaching ESL, they were like white or American people that happen to learn the language through their yeah. like graduate courses. And they will be explaining things to us in Spanish, but I'm like, eso no se dice así. Like, I'll, like I still have vivid ex like, I, memories of explaining to them. Like, I think what you're trying to say is, and then there, I got used to writing everything in Spanish at one point and translating it. And eventually, like, I started catching on in English, but I really didn't learn English. And it's really funny till yeah. I went to college because everything was ESL. So I had no choice but to be forced to learn the language. And then I forgot a lot of my native tongue, like, yeah. like a lot of, you know, like the, the words that came easily to me. Yes, I I mean, yeah, we have such a similar story. I think that for in terms of the ESL classes, there was always so much shame attached to it. We're like, oh, just class, all kids don't know what they're doing, you know, and things like that. And it was it was really hard for me. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm so grateful that I know both languages because I have two worlds that I can operate in, and I can also do business in two worlds. I mean, I do conferences in Me in Mexico, and I do them in Spanish, you know, and it's like such a blessing. And it was only it so. Yeah, in my 30s where I, I learned to be really grateful for the fact that I can, I, I understand not just one culture, but two, and I understand it really well. And I'm really grateful to my mom for, for giving me that opportunity. Like I, I had to, I had to figure that on my own, you know. Um, so that's awesome. Oh my God. I, I knew we were going to, once we, we started talking, we were going to, we were going to go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let me, so let me ask you the first question for uh, pertaining to the books, because this is not so much about what the stories are in the books but the story behind the story yeah. so the reason why you wrote the books and i think you've shared a little bit so far and the reason why you wrote the book and how did you how did you know that you needed to do these kinds of books so um wh when we started talking um you mentioned something about my poetry book and i'll just go back start there if that's okay um I always dabbled in little notes. Like I have, I had little notes for everything. Like I even, when I do an interview or anything, I hold on to my notebook because mm -hmm. I'll write things that come into my mind. And I don't know why, for as long as I can remember, I will hold on to a piece of paper and pen and just write anything beautiful that came to my mind and put it down there. Mm -hmm. And one time I was taking the train here in New York City. Um, I had a friend tell me like, what are you always scribbling? And I was very protective of my scribbles, you know, like any any person that felt like it's shame to be heard or ashamed to be seen or like almost embarrassed to share their world. I was like, no, nothing, nothing. I'm just doodling here. <laughs> like I'm writing X's and O's. And I remember one time we were riding the train from uh, from work home. We were both we're both from the Bronx. 
she told me, okay, you have to, you have to read me one line of something you wrote. And I'm like, or something you doodled. And I was like, if I, if I share this one line with you, will you leave me alone? <laughs> like that was the goal. Like I'll share this one line and you're going to stop pestering me. And I love her to death. Um, I eventually read to her an entire poem and it's called Bebe. And I wrote that poem because it has a lot to do with the mother daughter relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, writing was therapeutic. I, it didn't matter if I wrote the word correctly or not. It didn't matter if it looked pretty. You'll see lots of error messages like me writing over it, like not liking something. But it was for me an outlet of how to deal with some emotions, very tough emotions that a lot of us struggle with. And I wanted to write about the mother-daughter relationship, but when I wrote it in that poem, I realized that I wasn't talking about my mother-daughter relationship. I was talking about me as a mother and that growth that I saw happening. And when I read it to her, it struck her differently. She understood the poem to be differently. And it was amazing to me when I read, I, I read it out loud, she told me, you have to put this in print. You just have to. You have to put it out there. She goes, even if I'm the only one that buys your book. So I couldn't believe when she said that, how excited it got me. It sounds kind of weird. Mm -hmm. From me writing little notes and doodles on the, on the train when I had free time to think and decompress all my emotions, mm -hmm. uh, I put that book together and I was so proud of it. I was just so proud of putting my emotions out there, but I never shared it with like my immediate family. So my immediate family didn't even know I put this thing out there and they found me on Amazon. <laughs> and they're like, what? You, you're, that cover is beautiful. Thank um, you. Or, yeah. I was like, wow, this is really nice. And well, when I interacted with you, um, with Denise Soler, uh, I thought you just did the kids books. So then when I well, went on your page, um, when I went on your, um, on your webpage, I was like, wait, she's a poet. And I'm like, I'm a poet too. Oh my God. I got <laughs> So it's, so it's funny because, um, I, I, for, I forgot what I titled the, the, uh, the poetry book exactly, but it was supposed to be Mis Secret Mis Secretos Mas Intimos because it really like kind of shed a light in how I saw and view the world. And to this day, I really never advertise on that book because I just feel like, like whoever finds my happy secrets, I'm happy about it. But I, I want them to to be ready to to read my thoughts. Yeah. It it, it kind of like uh, revealed my thoughts on like social classism, poverty, patria, like colorism, and I talked a lot about that in in, in one of my poems. Mm -hmm. And it was my first poetry book, and I, I wasn't a perfect writer. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm gonna be very honest. I just knew I wanted to get my emotions and views of the world out there. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, a friend of mine from church bought the book, and she's like, "Yo sé tus secretos. I know your secrets." <laughs> and I was like, I had no. By the way, she approached me in the weirdest way. We were supposed to teach a primary class for kids. And she whispers that in my ears. And I'm thinking, she, like, it was so funny. Um, I thought she knew that I didn't want to come and teach a class. So I was like, oh, <laughs> like, I was embarrassed about that. And then she shows me the book. I'm like, oh, like, it was such a funny <laughs> And then she told me uh, something that was very interesting to her. Uh, she's like, you wrote about hair in such a, a unique way. I, I have one. Uh, uh, poem called Pelo, Pelo, uh, Pelo Malo Ni Pelo Bueno, something like that. And she actually shared her thoughts of important it is for her. Wow, I love that. I love that. I just love poetry book. Um, I can't wait to read it. Which is Thank you. Be, yeah, that's going to be um, real interesting. And um, oh, I remember what I was saying. I was saying earlier that uh, the reason why I love poetry is because in poetry there's no rules. And yes. I don't like rules. I don't like, you know, people telling me what to do. That's why I, when I was in the military, I only did one term and then I didn't renew my contract because I was all, this isn't for me. My personality is, I'm too free. <laughs> I don't like rules. I don't like structure. I like to just feel myself and my body and I move with whatever is coming to me. I think that's why I love poetry. So I'm, I can't wait to read your book because it oh, sounds thank you. like, 
it sounds like you pretty much are, we're very similar in the sense that we just write down whatever flows with you, right? Yes. My, I remember when my sister uh, discovered it, she said, it's, uh, she's, she uses this term when someone is a lot. She's like, it's like condensed milk y Malta India. It's like sweet and so opposite. <laughs> like, I was just like, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, it's good when people are relating your poetry to food, you know? <laughs> I know. It's such a Latino thing to do. Like, you know someone loves you when they give you food. <laughs> so do you do you write in English and Spanish when you do your poetry? Only in Spanish. For some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, there's a lot of emotions that I could express them easier in Spanish. Mm -hmm. I've struggled writing poems in English, like literally struggled, mm -hmm. because I feel like it's not me. I feel like I'm still that child that's stuck in the, in, at home. Like I, like I have to acclimate to the rules and norms here in the United States, if that makes sense. And I've always, always felt like that's why I still think like that. Like, mm -hmm. like I revert back to that. Mm -hmm. And it's something that it's a lot of training in me saying like, no, I'm, I'm this and, and I'm that. Like I'm trying to merge these two wonderful worlds that I created for myself by living here in the United States. Yeah, I, I think that for most of us Latinas, I think that, um, well, I can speak for myself, is like I think in English, but I'm, I'm feeling in Spanish. I um, I remember I lived in Puerto Rico for uh, a couple of years, and when I first got to Puerto Rico, I remember people were saying my name, they're like, oh, la señorita Diana Rosales, so cuando me presentaban, me decían, oh, mira, aquí está la directora de mercadeo de, de California, mm -hmm. and it was the first time que había escuchado que alguien dijera mi nombre correctamente, que me, que me, que me presentaran profesionalmente. And I was shocked, girl. I was like, oh, wow, this is how it feels. Like I, I almost was yeah. like crying because I was like, this is how it feels to be addressed in Spanish and to hear your, to hear my name. Oh, la señorita Adriana Rosales es esto, esto, esto. And I, I swear, girl, I would be so shocked just sitting there like I, I had never had that feeling in the United States of somebody um, saying my name. Yeah, it was. I, I think I, I relate to that in so many ways. So when I went to college, I I grew up Mormon, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I was sent to BYU Idaho. I went to that school and then to Utah. And I remember um, at that time when I went to school. I don't want to date myself. It's been a minute, <laughs> but it was less than eight percent minority that's including afro americans mm -hmm. uh latinos mm -hmm. uh samoan islanders uh, uh, and um people from uh asia and uh chinese india anything other that eight percent that was us mm -hmm. and we were so underrepresented and i remember when i said my name like hi my name is luz um people were like oh, okay hello luke and and I heard kind of like the kind of like the Snickers, like it's so different, it's so awkward, and and I even heard that from professors, you know, people in that academic setting, and it was a little, it was a little like kind of like saddening for me to see, uh, in those communities how we're not accepted or welcome, and it's something as simple as like say your name correctly, and I have to be honest. It's not just in those kind of communities when you go to college in, in a different state, but even here in the in New York City, like the melting pot. Like I had people say, oh, you say your name is Luce. Do you mean Lucretia? Like I had people change my name altogether just to try to Americanize it or <laughs> like I have stories. I have stories. And I remember when I went when I'm in DR is the same feeling or any other country that is not here, people are like, hola señora Luz Maria. Te gusta Luz Maria or Luz? It's like there's a respect to it. Or I think this is my favorite conversation. It's like, oh, Mac es tu nombre de casada. And I'll be like, yes, ¿cuál es tu nombre familiar de parte de tu madre? To me, it's like, yes, you get it. That is my story, where I've come from. Like, not... 
not me as the married woman know everything about me, you know? Yeah. Oh, and it's a big mm-hmm. fact. It is just such a respect, like a legacy respect. They want to know all fashions of who you are. Yeah. The, the young version of you, the married version of you, like, you know, this is all you. <laughs> yeah. It was like, it's like they see you, you know? That's how I felt in Puerto Rico. I was like, they were seeing me, you know? And they would make jokes and stuff because they would be like, oh, hablas como mexicana, because, you know, we're from Mexico. And, uh, um, and they would have me talk in Spanish because they would say, oh, como hablan, habla como hablan las películas en las novelas mexicanas. Y, and I'm uh, like, what do you mean? <laughs> How do we talk? And it was great. It was wonderful. I, I just loved them. They treated me so amazing. And I have never felt so at home. And the funny yeah. thing is that Puerto Rico is part of the United States. Yeah. And yeah. there's so many Americans that don't even know that. They're like, oh, you went, you went, um, up, um, what is it? You went international? And I'm like, no. Yes. Puerto Rico's part yeah. of the United States. <laughs> it's just crazy, girl. Some of these things, I think that we can only, as Latinas, we're the only ones that can really understand it. But, um, you know, it's just an amazing, amazing um, way of, of, I think, being in two worlds and then understanding two worlds. And I think that for me, that's, a, that's a, a blessing. And I think for you, what I hear you saying is that it has been, you know, you maneuvering into two worlds. It hasn't been easy, but at the end of the day, I mean, look at where you're at now, right? So so my second question for you is, <laughs> my second question for you is, um, what, how has life changed for you since you published the books, girl? Because you have seven books out now. So. How, how has life changed since you became published as opposed to how it was before? Yeah, so when I became a, a published author, um, one of the things I've learned is that you understand a little bit more about the business of writing book, and then you also could understand uh, the content and the material that is needed. And I'll explain a little further. We had a conversation about education, right? And like how important it is for kids to see themselves and their teachers and things like that. So one of the reasons why I'm saying like the content that is needed, when I started writing, for example, Pequeña Maria, Little Maria, I started taking this into certain schools and me bringing that content in, we have developed like some um, tools around it and how to educate kids and how to have healthy discussions about race and culture and upbringing in a way that is very much needed. You don't want to wait till we're adults and we're having these conversations yeah. and people feel awkward in navigating those situations. So that is one way writing has really helped me. Like I could, I'm speaking from experience and I make it inclusive and relatable. Mm-hmm. And the reason I'm using these two words inclusive is because I always tell kids, you don't have to look like Maria. Tell me, tell me what some of your favorite things to do. And I'm like, oh, you see, like Maria, she likes to climb mango trees, she likes to play butterflies, and you like to play with your puppy, and you like to run in the park. That's relatable. They're, you guys are both running. Like, I kind of bridge those two worlds in a way that people think it's just so simple, but it's so needed because yeah. the truth of the matter is, these kids are going to grow up into adults. They need to have a healthy understanding and a healthy way of thinking Mm -hmm. how they're going to relate to other human beings that do not look like them, that do not grow up in the same neighborhoods as them, or don't have the same resources as them. Mm -hmm. And it'll it'll be more beautiful if we could provide those tools that there's a bridge so they could see each other alike instead of continuing to grow this big divide that we have where people are feeling like they're sectioned off in society. So... As, a, as, a, as I publish my books and I talk about giving a face to the faceless and children and giving a face to bilingual homes, that's something I'm really an advocate of, uh, about. And I advocate about it very strongly on the day to day. So that's one way my life has changed that I've been sought after as a speaker in that avenue. And I really, really commend people when they acknowledge there's a need for that and they acknowledge that they're, they come across kids that struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's been a need for that for the last 30 years because I remember when I was a little girl not seeing any of these books. My very first book oh, yeah. I saw that was Spanish and English was when I was in college, girl. And it was yes. from um, Francisco Alarcón and it was a poetry book and it was all these beautiful uh, pictures of like una señora mexicana con unos yeah. mexicanos. And then I was like, wait, 
that looks like me, you know? And I started crying when I saw the book because it was the first kid's book that I had ever seen that portrayed me. And I, and I was already, you know, in my twenties and I, I, you know, this was again, a long time ago. And then, so here we are having this conversation in 2020 and you're one of those authors, you're one of those authors that's shifting the shifting, um, you know, the face. And I love what you just said, which is you're giving a face to the faceless. I love that because there's so many people out there that need to see these books. They need to read them and they need to read them with their kids, regardless of race. It needs to be part of the fabric of the United States. Um, I believe because of what it brings to the table, it brings inclusion and, and diversity and that's what we're about. So I love that, yeah. that you just said that. So, and, and that's my humble prayer that people continue to see when they see my children's books in that, in that level of care because sometimes people look at it and they're like, okay, great, but we have books that have kids that look like this and they're not, you know, like it doesn't need to be bilingual. Or they say that, but I'm like, yeah, you're right. It might not need to be bilingual. It could all be in English, mm -hmm. but how are we including, uh, how are we making it inclusive to how many children do you have in your class that come from a bilingual home? And that's the mm -hmm. question I'll ask. How many of them related to this one book that is not bilingual <laughs> and, and, and and you know like it's it's a healthy discussion because it needs to be had and i think it, it needs to be had because we're trying to serve this audience these children that need to see that and understand that so when they go to college or they become adults and someone goes oh my god you speak or another language how is that for you teach me and things like that. It's a, it's a much different conversation or I've learned a different language. And these are the things that I've realized when I'm speaking it instead of like, Oh my gosh, you speak broken English <laughs> or Oh my gosh, <laughs> like, like, how long did it take you to learn it? <laughs> like, 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 and I, and I, and I'm giving these statements, not, not, I know we're laughing about it nicely now, but like, it's, these it's are true. These, it's true. And people are having these experiences. And then they're like the ones trying to walk out of those awkward moments and be like, you're right. It took me a while. I still say jello instead of yellow. <laughs> like, <laughs> like things like that. I mean, and it's okay. It's like, yeah, I say, I say a lot of words in English that are like not even right. Like, and I'm still learning words, you know, and I, for a long time in my twenties, I was really ashamed of it, but now I'm like, who cares? Like really? Like, it doesn't yeah. even matter because it's like who I am and I come from two worlds and you come from two worlds and we're, you know, and we get citizens. it. What was that? And we get it. Like, yeah. like, and I said, and we get it. And it makes us like laugh about it and be proud of it. Cause we're like, we know, and you know what we're trying to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I love it. And I think that, uh, well, earlier you just said it's all a healthy conversation. And it's true. Yes. Yeah. It's, it, everything starts with a conversation, everything. So we, we're the ones, this generation, you, myself, and a bunch of other women, Latina women, we're the ones who need to bring this conversation forward because it, we need to have it. We need to have a conversation. Yeah. There's, <clears throat> there's too many too many things going on right now in the world where uh, people are trying to suppress. Oh, you know, you can't be speaking Spanish in, in this country. And it's, like, it's like, I feel like I'm, you know, I was born in the 70s, but I feel like I'm sure like in the 1950s or 60s, right? And I'm thinking it's 2020. Why are people talking about we can't be speaking Spanish? You know, like and the only way I believe it, to combat that is uh, through art, through compassion, through love, through, through art. I mean, I think art, um, in writing and poetry, it's a form of art. It's the highest form of art, I believe, and it, it changes. It changes the world. Words change the world, and that's one of the beautiful things that you do. With your, not only are you writing kids' books, but then you also, uh, I know that you're working with uh, artists to do the little girls. And and, and oh, tell me about um, the little monitas that you had. That like in the and there was like um, you, you you have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to see that. Yes. Um, so I work with this older, this older lady. Her name is Ana Maria. Um, she's in Venezuela. And, and I'm not sure if you know um, kind of like what's going on in Venezuela. Like right now, they're very in a very hard time. Mm -hmm. um, if we're having a hard time because of COVID, they're just having 
a ridiculous hard time because you know uh, a lot of them struggle to have food and right now their entire economy is just like completely in shambles a lot of people are just in such a such a stressful chaotic time there so i work with this lady and i feel like so proud of her because when we connected regardless of what's going on in venezuela regardless of her situation that we talk about it a lot she still has a lot of passion to live and a lot of passion to express art so we connected because i i said i want to you know give a face to the faceless and give curly hair, caramel skin, chocolatey skin girls, a doll because it is them. And she's like, I am for it. I love it. And um, she started making my dolls like that. I only order a limited quantity. So I never sell these on the website. I always sell them through social media mm -hmm. because I also um, hold on to them. They're made with so much love. Like it takes so much time. And she does everything from like the paper slip where it comes from, what it includes. And this is so cute. I think it's so funny because I grew up. The dog comes with underwear. <laughs> oh, how cute. Can you put it up to the camera? Can you put it up to yeah, the camera? Yeah, it, it comes out with underwear. Oh, how cute. Like, or, or I, I think we call it panties or panteletas in some other places they call it that. <laughs> and this is for the for the <laughs> new book that should be coming out in 2021. Oh, and, and, and I want to make sure she has a cultural attire, but I also want to highlight other other countries. It's not just going to be about me because I happen to be Dominican. No, yeah. it's Latino America. It's us. It's yeah. like us in, in every beautiful form. And she also has her little undies, which I think is so, so cute. cute. I love it. it. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> Babe. Yeah, those are yeah. When I when I saw that when you were being interviewed by Denise, I I was like, oh my god, that that's awesome because um, yeah, I love I love children's books. Like I believe I shared with you that one of my 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 goals my on my bucket list is to do the kids book and and all that. And I'm like, oh yay, I can I can pick your brain, right? So, yes, of course. And I also so for people that don't have the dolls. My books include mariquitas. I, in my country, they call it mariquitas. I know they're called paper dolls, or oh, that's awesome. um, or I think someone calls them. Uh, I I forgot. They they have several unique names, right? So is that the ones where you you take them out, right, and then you yeah you cut it oh, out. I love that. And then I included a coloring page. Uh huh. In the back, and then also like a note section, like you know. What's the, what's the age? What's the age geared towards for the book? Uh, since it's a very simple book, Pequeña Maria, I usually tend to use it for primary age and primary age anywhere from two, like starting school, like pre, like pre K, right, mm -hmm. to like first grade. First grade is already a little like too old because they're already learning more than sight words. But sometimes it's, I've been going into kindergarten and first grade. I mean, it is ideal for kindergarten because that's when they're using their motor skills and learning a lot more. But first grade is like the, the oldest. And then they tend to be like six or seven years old. Can you show us the covers of the books real quick? Just so we yeah. can see. So this is Pequeña Maria, Little Maria. And this is where the, uh, the read aloud animation is gonna come out in June. Mm -hmm. oh, that's and cool. this is gonna be the second animation that I'll be working on pretty soon. It's called Maria the Super Helper, Maria la Super Ayudante. And this book also includes the the paper dolls, right? Oh, what a wonderful idea, girl. That's awesome. Um, I do really believe that uh, the educational aspect of it is to get our kids moving and get them away from tablets. I know it sounds so funny. We're saying get them away from tablets <laughs> and technology. And here we are having a Zoom call. <laughs> but... but you know, uh, when they're young, they really need more uh, constru constructive time to let their imagination soar more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, my other book, it's that, uh, that's how we met. You heard my daughter singing. It's, it starts with you. Yeah. It's a song. Cre it's a song and I created into a children's book. And in the back of the book, for kids that are learning to play the piano, it has the music sheet. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's amazing. And then 
my last book that I did this now uh, in COVID times is Natalie the Brave. Oh, I love that. I love the colors in that one. I saw that one on the page. I think that's the one I ordered, I think. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I love and it. it I'm so impressed. Oh, I'm so impressed with all the creativity. It's just amazing. It's so amazing. Um, so my last question, Luz, is um, what would you, what would advice would you give to other writers as they begin their, their writing journey, especially for women in, in children's books? So a lot of my time I spend uh, people reaching out to me, um, asking me, hey, what should I do if I want to write a book? What's the first thing you did? And I told them, start writing. Just start writing anything. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, take, I usually say do like a daily journal of 15 to 20 minutes a day. Write anything that comes to mind, right? Anything that comes to your heart. And then after a week or two of seeing everything you're writing, read what you wrote. There's a theme there. If you're writing, for example, every day about you wanting to go to the beach, maybe you should write a book about that. There, there's something there that calls to you that you keep writing about that. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's more important to focus on what you're passionate about than um, learning a new subject because you are kind of like, well versed on what you want to do where your passion lies because that's what you know most best about mm -hmm. so i do encourage people to keep a journal and keep writing things and rereading it and then once they're ready they can share it with friends and family member don't be like me hiding it because <laughs> it took a friend to push me to publish something to figure out that's what i really wanted to do in life that's awesome oh my god thank you so much for sharing all of that so I definitely will, um, you know, I'm looking forward to getting your books and then I'm also looking forward to reading your poetry so I can learn all your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, I would love to have you, <laughs> yeah, I would love to have you back, uh, you know, on your next book when you publish your next book. Um, do you, I mean, are you planning on writing more? I have another book that is actually in the works and um, I actually shared this with Denise Soler. It's called The Elephant Family Parade and it's not gonna be bilingual. And the reason why is because it's a chapter book mm -hmm. and it's gonna be, hi baby. Um, the chapter yeah. book <laughs> is gonna be really highlighting a lot of themes about families and you know, being of good cheer when things are of trial and mm -hmm. like grueling so um i do hope to translate that eventually but right now i just want to put it out there mm -hmm. and it's not gonna depict children it's gonna depict elephants because i thought i wanted to try something different oh and wow. why not mm -hmm. because you could you only get better if you test the waters <laughs> you don't get better at swimming if you stay on the sandy area watching from afar so i wanted to try that and yeah. and i can't wait for you guys to see that i'm hoping to release that in another couple months awesome oh my god well when that's released i would love to have you on again and i definitely yeah. appreciate your time this morning thank you so much for being with me um oh thank you so let me see. So I want to thank all the listeners that took the time to listen in. Remember to subscribe to our channel and check out the links below for um, Luz, where I'm going to have all of her links and uh, her pictures of her books and all that good stuff so you guys can connect with her. You definitely want to reach out, um, you know, if you love her stories or if you want to, if you want your, your children to be growing up with this kind of content, I really highly recommend that you, that you seek her out and, and you connect with Luz. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us and I will see you next time. Let's stay connected, Luz, and I look forward wow. to talking to, to you again. All right, thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you again.